measuring equity using open data, building evidence-based policy and reparation advocacy. Today, I am, you know, I'll briefly introduce myself. My name is David Scatterday. I'm the managing director of Scatterday Associates. We're a consulting practice that really looks at how data informs more efficient and effective policy development and analysis. Um, and you know, today we're going to focus on a very specific area of social policy that's nascent and emerging and very excited to have two incredibly esteemed panelists to really drive this conversation. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Enith Williams. So Enith is the founder and executive director of the Reparations Finance Lab. Uh, RFL is a financial services nonprofit that seeks to engage capital markets to design innovative financial products and processes that will deliver that will deliver reparative capital to the descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. I'd also like to warmly welcome Robin Rue Simmons. She's the founder and executive director of First Repair, a new nonprofit organization that informs local reparations nationally. She's a former Fifth Ward Alderman for the city of Evanston, Illinois, where she led in collaboration with others the passage of the nation's first ever municipal funded reparations legislation. So to really kind of anchor our conversation today, we wanted to share some of the key uh, summary items that we'll cover in our session. So reparations as a policy space is experiencing a massive increase in momentum and movement. Uh, where we're seeing so much of this activity and forward motion is at the state and local level. And we're really excited to be part of this forum and conference because open data as a construct can really serve as a powerful linchpin to measure the disparate impact of discriminatory policies. And that measurement can really serve to increase precision in the way that policy is designed, implemented, and measured. Today, we're really going to focus on one small dimension of this broader issue of disparate impact and, discrim and discriminatory policy uh, with redlining. So redlining is a broad set of activities, but today's session is going to focus on financial service redlining, where um, you know, different types of financial services were offered or uh, rescinded from different geographical jurisdictions based off of uh, race or skin color. And you know this is a this is an interesting place to begin to understand that intersection of open data uh, and measurement because of how tightly defined some of these mapping elements were. So we're going to use this as an anchor point for our conversation that we'll re revisit um, over and over again for the over the course of the next hour. And really, you know, I think there's a, a, a broad canvas of innovative solutions to reparations broadly, and I think we're going to begin to delve into some of those as well. So to really kind of baseline us, I think, you know, and if I'd love to pass it over to you to share some key kind of macro perspective points around this moment that, that we're currently living in and the impact on, on our audience. Okay, thank you, David. And thank you again to the New York City Open Data team. And I really want to say a very special thank you to Robin Drew Simmons, who has joined me on this panel. As you will hear, Robin is really, really the champion of the current reparations movement. She has done something that we may have not thought possible even five years ago. Um, and you'll hear more from her, but thank you again, Robin, for joining me. I think on macro um, level, um, David spoke about it. There seems to be a momentum and conversation, and we locate this current really hard conversation and discussion um, in the aftermath of the George Floyd murder and that kind of global outpouring of um, outrage at, at, what, uh, at what people witnessed and a real deep um, clamoring to understand why is race still such a very strong issue today, um, still. Um, and not just in the United States, I want to say the issue of reparations is located in the countries and the former colonies that were established by the European colonialists. So the conversation is also in the Caribbean, it's in South America, it's in Central America, anywhere chattel slavery, African chattel slavery existed. But back to the U.S., the George Floyd murder really seemed to uh, coalesce a, a real deep conviction that something had to be done. And and also, we moved to a conversation, it seems to me, where people really 
in the general public accepted that racism remained a very, very strong and current um, force in our society. And so the question is, what do we need to, what, what can be done around it? You saw some movement with the um, financial and the private sector saying, we want to come in and we want to deploy capital to really begin to uh, break out some of those structural inequalities because in their assessment, that was a part of the issue. But the conversation around reparations is much broader than um, just individual uh, repairing for individuals. There is the entire understanding of our con of our history as a nation and how we got to it, this place where there's a very persistent racial wealth gap, where the achievement gap for blacks lacks that of um, the majority white population, and so. There's a conversation. There's also a national movement for the first time. There's HR 40, which is a bill that is introduced in the House of Representatives to actually establish a commission to study reparations. This is and about two or three weeks ago, Robin, I think I saw there was notice that there may be enough votes to actually get that bill passed. In so it then goes up, you know, committee and, and start to be. Um, Marked up. This is really a landmark and a watershed in the reparations movement. Um, but where the excitement is is at the local level. There are at the moment, I think, I think approximately 415. Our partner at um, Columbia um, that tracks these have said there are about 415 local reparations initiatives by a range of actors, by private sector actors. Um, municip municipalities and cities are leading, of course, um, the, the religious movement and universities. And so you're beginning to see sort of the top down at the federal level and then at the bottom up at the local grassroots level action and activity taking place. And there, I think finally, just to close out, the, the strong feeling for the first time, I think, for those in the reparations movement is that there is a national will to finally do something. And there's even data in Poland that shows that before George Floyd and that horrible event, um, the consensus and, you know, when you poll folk about reparations, you would get maybe 20, 30 percent of the population say maybe. And out post George Floyd, the numbers moved to more than 50 percent of the population saying there is something about the original harm of chattel slavery, of the effect of labor, and the, in a, and the fact that black people were never paid for that labor that has persisted and created the challenges that we have today. So that is also an interesting development. And so, um, yeah, and, and so I think we, you know, the, the, the conversation may have been stalled, but initiatives such as we have in, um, that we'll hear about in Evanston is definitely moving that conversation forward. Yeah, no, thank, thank you, Inith. I think you really articulately captured uh, the key trends that we're going to capture today. We're at this inflection point post George Floyd. There's political will, activities happening at the local level, and data can really be the fuel to drive more collective action. So I think what would be really, what really useful is to really kind of anchor us in a shared vocabulary and share some definitions around redlining, which is the, sub, the subspace of uh, discriminatory action that, that we're gonna really focus on today. So redlining is a discriminatory, a discriminatory practice that really puts services out of reach for communities based off of um, external markers like race and ethnicity. And like you, you'll see on the left, uh, a sample map from New York um, of red line districts as defined by the homeowners loan, loan corporation. And you'll see the definitions on, on the left is on the left in terms of like what those meant in terms of desirability and uh, propensity to lend, right? So the, what, what's so fascinating about redlining is just the tightness of the definition of the disparate impact and the discrimination, which kind of forms a really powerful um, baseline for this conversation. And another, you know, really interesting way to think of housing is that it's really foundational, right? So while that's a first order discriminatory action, it is highly associated with deeply kind of um, high impact second order uh, discriminatory outputs or outcomes, right? That fall into the environmental, 
uh, arena, health, mobility, and education. Uh, so when we think of this, it really is kind of a truly intersectional conversation, an analytical exercise that we're set up to do. Um, and, you know, Robin or, or Anneth, I'd love to open it up to you here if you'd like to speak to any of these um, and, and kind of how redlining kind of and the discriminatory housing impacts really intersect with, with other forms of harm. Well, I, I'll kick off and then hand over to Robin. I think there, there's a, a, a policy construct that we all um, have currently, which is around the social determinants of health. And we find that in those communities where redlining predominated, you find that you can track over time the ways in which those communities and the families and individuals who live in those communities underperform the population in terms of um, health indicators, in terms of um, environmental safety, in terms of education, in terms of just a general sense of well-being in terms of um, mental health um, challenges, in terms of longevity, right, and, and, and quality of life. And so that initial harm, which is a denial of um, a, a mortgage to a individual and a, to a community with redlining, has this flow through because that the community that's denied, it's not just mortgages that were denied. You also had business and economic opportunity loans that were denied. You had um, services um, that were denied, uh, city services uh, also denied. And those kind of overtime denial create this knock-on effect that those communities seem to be struck and stuck in just a real underperformance grid. Um, Robin? Yeah, really not much more to add, but it's what brought me to my work in 2019 in introducing reparations. It's that place is a determinant for most things. And as mentioned already, I can speak very specifically to being a uh, Black resident in Evanston living in the Fifth Ward. That uh, meant that we were the only ones that didn't have access to a neighborhood school we didn't have access to environmental wellness. We had um, air quality issues because of mass busing and um, other environmentally unsafe businesses. We didn't have access and still don't have access to healthy foods in a walkable distance. We're the only community or census tract in our community that is a food desert um, in a very wealthy, affluent community. Uh, we do not have access to important community amenities as well as local businesses, uh, service businesses, and so on. And that was because of historic harm, uh, redlining, but also locally enforced uh, anti-Black housing policies and practices that were enforced and created the disparate conditions in the Black community. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Robin. I think, you know, in, when we are able to really understand um, you know, the, the definitional elements of redlining, it's, it's also useful to share a, a, a vocabulary for what reparative action can look like. So we, we did some research with a partner, or we're able to access research from a partner, the African American Address Network, to, to really understand what the entire canvas of space looks like for reparative action. So when we anchor ourselves into a specific policy initiative or action, we really understand it as part of a, a larger set of activities it would, you know, uh, would, would really kind of encompass complete or comprehensive reparative action. So, and I'll pass it. I'll begin with you. Any any notes or comments on this kind of sure, multi-dimensional sure. definition? So the big conversation around reparations is is that the movement is located within the framework of international human rights um, framework, right? And so we would have heard as, as Americans about reparations being paid, for example, to the um, Japanese who were interred during um, World, World War II. We would have paid, um, heard about reparations being made to specific tribal um, nations that were um, denied and, and, um, and taken off of their, their, their tribal lands. We would have also heard about payments to the Tuskegee um, uh, men who were deliberately infected with syphilis, not not treated as a medical experiment for the U.S. government, right? So they were paid reparations, and the case was it, um, ar uh, argued on international human rights grounds. And their 
core principles, which is rehabilitation, right? Um, it's not just a financial payment. It really speaks about as much as possible trying to make the victims whole and it centers the victims, right? There's the compensation aspect of it. Um, and in the U.S., the conversation um, around reparations, I just want to put this um, data point out there, the calculations range um, of what a financial compensation would be from the low billions, couple billions, to as much as $17 trillion, right? And the calculation is, is basically based on what was the input of the unpaid um, labor of the enslaved um, Africans into the building of American wealth, right? And then you you get a, a number and you compound it with interest and then you, you get that figure, right? Um, then there's the satisfaction, um, which is really an interesting piece of this. And um, our partner at um, the African Affair Network spoke about just having healing circles, right? Communities that have been harmed and with the majority communities being able to sit together and sit with the harm and just talk about it and come to a place of common understanding. Um, restitution, um, you want to put folk in their original situation may not be possible here because you're speaking about the descendants of, of slavery, but that is also important. And most importantly, I think, um, as we grapple with modern day reparations is a guarantee of non-repetition. We will no longer repeat the harm. And it may seem almost, you know, counterintuitive. Well, you know, we are, as, an, as a planet, we think we're past the issue of, of um, human slavery, but we actually are not, right? So we need to have that understood that that's an aspect of that. Robin, do you want to add anything? Uh, yes, just to add that uh, there's a lot of discussion in the reparations community around what form of reparations and cash benefits. And so I just want to add that uh, with cash benefits alone and without addressing the five components of full repair, it still is insufficient because we've done nothing to uh, rehabilitate the people. And um, as Edith mentioned, guarantee of non-repetitions is probably one of the first priorities. If we have cash benefit programmings or other types of compensation that's then going into predatory lending practices and unresolved, you know, hidden redlining and anti-Black policies uh, that, that are baked into current legislation, uh, what have we really accomplished? And so what we're seeing now is many communities are doing the satisfaction well, uh, monuments and acknowledgments and other types of street namings and so on is happening. And so we don't want to dismiss that as important reparative justice, but we also want to move into uh, tangible and measurable outcomes of repair and uh, really excited to see what's happening with localities across the nation in, in working towards that. You know, for, for many Americans, uh, the concept of reparations is relatively new and is kind of emerging and nascent as a set of act collective actions. Uh, but, you know, in the United States, it actually has a history that's over 150 years old. So, you know, I, I wonder if you could just high point some of these key milestones yeah. in, in our long national dialogue with reparative action in the United States. Yeah, so I think, you know, what's important about reparations and the movement is that it has always been Black-led. It has always been led by the victims themselves. Even during enslavement, we have, um, historical evidence of enslaved people who usually when their owners would move them from a slave state to a non-slave state successfully suing for reparations. The petitions were always made and as we got to the point of um, emancipation that was a foundational tenant of um, emancipation. Yes we want to be free but we also understand that we were robbed of our wealth and we want to have reparations paid. Okay. It was it was part of the conversations had with um, Lincoln and with Congress and for various reasons which we won't go into now, it did not happen. Interestingly to note is that actually the um, enslavers, the owners, were compensated for the loss of their property. And that did not just happen in the US, it happened in the Caribbean, it happened in South America. They, 
they, they, the consciousness was that the, the, the owners were losing wealth, not that the enslaved were harmed. Um, you move into a period of post-emancipation into reconstruction, and this is, this is really painful. Um, despite not getting reparations, black communities and black individuals and families gathered together and established really, really successful communities by the sweat of their own brows and their own work. And what they faced was white terror, white um, hostility, and the destruction of what they have created. And I think we have heard, um, certainly, again, post George Floyd, the conversations about um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. But those are not, that was not an isolated incident. This happened where throughout the South and where successful black communities were established with thriving businesses. Um, black schools and healthy communities, the neighboring um, white communities um, destroyed them. Of course, and um, not only did you not have um, emancipation, but then we also got into the period of legal segregation, right? And Jim Crow, from which is one aspect of redlining, right? You're, you're keeping people to a defined um, community. Um, but at every step of the way, there's always been this call for pay us what we have earned by this country. And I, there's another data point I like to put out, which is there's a calculation that the total household wealth of the United States at this moment is around a hundred trillion dollars, right? That's all of the properties and all the things that Americans own. Of that, African Americans own only 3% of that, right? Um, around three trillion dollars, right? Um, those are data, that's information that is so important for the consideration and goes into this timeline as we use data to better understand the longevity of the harm and also what it would take to repair the harm. Thank you, Edith. You know, I think what's so interesting about this conversation is we began to talk about the multidimensionality of harm, right, and how redlining can be a, a single source that has secondary and tertiary effects. Um, you know, I think let's get into kind of action um, on the ground. I was hoping you could, you know, share with us, uh, you know, Robin and Enith as well, some of the actual initiatives that are, that are gaining traction and what some of the dimensionality is around the harm that they're addressing across the United States. I'm turning this totally over to Robin. She's 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 awesome. at the forefront of this. Thank you. Um, as was mentioned earlier, our partners at the African American Redress Network have a mapping tool where they're keeping track of who's doing what at a local level um, as it relates to reparative justice. And you can see that some, there, and it's color coded here. You can see that there are various forms of reparations that are that are happening. Uh, we mostly hear about more compensation related uh, redress, but there are many, many, um, many areas of redress that are happening. We just actually convened about 60 local leaders from across the nation. Um, Edith took lead in that in Evanston, and we were learning and sharing together on our initiatives and how we can strengthen our, our own goals. But I would recommend that you get more familiar with this mapping tool and see that folks are acknowledging harm for lynching and mass incarceration and over-policing, various predatory practices, segregation, uh, plunder, and stripping away of wealth. And that is what we've addressed in Evanston is opportunity and wealth loss uh, from our practices that were discriminating in housing and zoning laws. Thank you, Robin. And you know, one thing that emerged earlier was that the most performant vehicle for this action is really at the municipal level, right? So, so you know, I think what we work together is just to give some snapshots of cities that are actually moving on this issue and, and what some of those look like. Um, you know, Enith, Robin, I'd love any thoughts you have here on some of the sure. dimensions or, or sure. perspectives of the team. You know, as an Evanstonian, I couldn't be prouder of my city uh, to take that first sort of shaky, uncomfortable step toward repair, understanding how big the need is and that we can't address it as a municipality. We are in full support of HR 40, um, but we passed a, a tangible reparations initiative allocating the first $10 million of our cannabis sales tax to begin the work of repair. 
Um, other cities have followed and now even states. And so we really love and support the work that's happening in San Francisco and Sacramento and Denver, Asheville and Amherst, uh, where they were uh, next in line after Evanston. And as I mentioned, we all just spent three days together in Evanston learning and sharing together. We'll be reconvening actually in D.C. Um, on the 1st and 2nd of April so that we can strengthen our efforts. But each of these cities is looking at their specific harm. So it is important that we separate the harm of the federal government, the goals of H.R. 40, the responsibilities and the purview of educational systems and healthcare systems and other industries and institutions and that is hyper-local and specific to municipal actions uh, and legislation that harmed uh, Black residents. And so there's just a few that are highlighted here, but there are so many more. It seems every week we're hearing of another city that is taking a step forward. Just last week, Providence, Rhode Island took a very big step forward. And uh, we are aware of grassroots efforts and other leaders in uh, New York that are, are looking to advance as well. Yeah. And I want to say a word here about Reparations Finance Lab. And our effort is really located in working with the private capital markets to enter into this discussion because our case, we, we take the stance that the, globe, the African enslavement was one of the first global economic event activity, right? Big, big economic activity. It joined the globe um, in what we are now used to in common, commonly... Uh, what we call a uh, takedown of, 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 you know, it was as if they had found a brand new oil well, right? So you had African slaves that had to be transported to um, plantations in the United States, in the Caribbean, in Central America, in South America. That was a capital intensive activity. And that, that led to the creation of some very innovative um, instruments that we now use bonds and credit notes and, and uh, currency exchanges and the entire globe of wealth holders got involved and said, hey, there's money to be made in African um, bodies. Let's pool our resources. And so the reparations lab has made a case that we need to then go back to the capital markets and say, you know, you know how to make things right with capital enter into discussion with us, let us create impactful structures that are big enough and scalable to really move the needle on some of these stubborn issues, issues around home ownership that we can measure and, and track over time, issues around business formation, access to capital, because as, as welcome as individual initiatives are from various um, banks and, and, and institutions, we know in, as capital allocators that scale and collaboration is what really creates impact. And so that's what the, the, the Reparations Finance Lab is working to do, to have that discussion with the private capital markets. And I just yeah. want to jump in and add something there to um, what Enif is doing is so important because what we're finding at a local level, when we've taken our first steps, we've uncovered just how much this needs to be an all hands on deck uh, commitment from other institutions and industries in the community that layered on discriminating practices and harm. And so we have um, begun to follow the model that Enith has uh, mentioned and now look at our local financial institution and other businesses in the community to add value to our commitment from the municipal government. Thank you. Robin, that's a great transition into a case study about the Evanston program itself. And I think the way that data played a role is going to be very, um, it's going to be, it's going to be you know, really valuable for our audience today. So if you could kind of frame up, you know, what it felt like, what it was like to be a first mover in such a critical space and those challenges, uh, your policy design considerations and how you ultimately landed on, on this on solution. So it was the data actually that um, led me to the epiphany of local reparations. It was looking, knowing the narrative, living in the history and our current conditions and seeing the results, but not really understanding. But it was following the data. We had a $46,000 household income divide between Black and White Evanston. We had all sorts of achievement and access grants and education grant uh, gaps 
a 13 year life expectancy data, 71% of our marijuana arrests were in the community, in the black community, while we were 16% of the population. And the data just went on and on and on. And I just had to take a look back and realize that it was no, uh, not any necessarily any current policy, because we were doing equity work well. We're known for our equity, diversity, and inclusion work in Evanston, but we had not done enough to address the past harms and that's where we really needed to begin the work. And so data led me to the conclusion of local reparations. And so the problem was that we have a uh, exodus in the black community, a decline in the population, a trajectory that was on a decline in our home ownership rates, as well as our household income rates and our achievement gap. We needed to address that and we needed to address it with a solution. And so I've always led uh, with a solutions only sort of hashtag solutions only approach to um, to leadership. And so we had to come up with how do we identify a remedy in direct correlation to the harm so that we have a viable legislative opportunity for reparations and not one that is just aspirational, not one that you know starts and ends with an apology or an acknowledgement one that is tangible. And so through community meetings, stakeholders being at the forefront of identifying and prescribing the remedy um, and sharing their stories and an important uh, report that was done by Shorefront Legacy Center, we uh, move forward with passing a policy starting with a $10 million commitment to, uh, to repair the harm done in our community in the area of housing and economic development. And so uh, the result in passing that opening up an application process was we had a 600, 620 applicants in our first opening that was a three week open process. And we have the first uh, 16 have been already identified. The additional 116 will follow after. And it's important to note that those that had a direct harm are first being repaired. And so the 116 of the 620 are residents that lived in Evanston, Black residents that lived in Evanston between 1919 and 1969 is when our city had anti-Black uh, housing practices and zoning laws. And then their direct descendants make up the additional uh, 620. We have um, decided that from the community's feedback that a $25,000 direct benefit to build wealth and housing is the first uh, form of repair. And we have you know, years, at least 10 years ahead of us. My hope is that future councils will continue it in perpetuity, but we do have 10 years left of our program to continue identifying, repair, funding it, and delivering uh, redress to our residents. Thank you, Robin. You know, and, and let's to, to drill down on the policy design conversation and data's potential role here. I was really fascinated by you know the, the beautiful balance between the precision of the intervention and the access to the program. So if you could maybe walk us through some of the considerations when designing, you know, the, the access path for, for this for this program and its benefits. Sure. And so this wasn't an easy process because everybody Black in Evanston has been harmed just by nature of the history of the transatlantic slave trade and being descendants of such. And so we have a also a very diverse Black community. The whole diaspora is represented in Evanston, Illinois, and I love that about our city. But we had to really identify what is the specific harm that the city of Evanston is accountable for. We can't pass and enforce uh, slavery reparations in Evanston. We can't, you know, pass and enforce um, a, 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 a policy or legislation that's outside of our purview. So we, we identified a zoning law that was on our books between that 50 year period. And it was in effect until fair housing was passed in 1968. And so we determined that if you were black and lived in Evanston, this zoning law harmed you because how it restricted you to live in a predominantly uh, under-resourced community that had fewer livability qualities. Yeah. And so that was our uh, guideline for eligibility. 
And then if you are a descendant, I qualify as a descendant. Six years, six generations of my family are Evansonians. So I am harmed because my mother and grandmother and great grandparents in Evanston did not have access to the same livability and wealth opportunities and quality of life as our white friends and neighbors in town. And so that determines the eligibility. We had a very uh, robust list of qualifying documents to make it easy and attainable for all residents. We tried to reduce the barrier so there was no process racism or anything. Uh, you could qualify with a birth certificate or a school photo, a yearbook photo, a marriage license, a baptismal record, death certificates, you know, a long list of, um, of documents. We partnered with our public library to be that source as well as our local uh, historians. We have an Evanston History Center and Shorefront Legacy Center. So they could go to any one of those three partners that they had a full uh, volumes of phone books, Evanston phone books, all the volumes of our public school district yearbooks. Obituaries was another, probably one of the top three forms of documentation to prove your race and place in Evanston and your eligibility for um, the program. And so it was a collective effort where there were many municipal uh, leaders or public administrators or city staff rather that participated in this eligibility process and made it simple. We had open office hours where residents could come in and access their information, get support that they needed. We had home visits, you know, phone calls because many of those applying were seniors and maybe had digital divides and other barriers. And so we worked really hard to make sure that as many people as possible could qualify and access their information for eligibility. Yeah, this is incredible. If I could ask one question, in terms of the, the program, uh, the allocation of funding, was there any role for data, um, any gaps in the data? What, what was the, the kind of the larger position that data took in, in kind of designing the actual um, allocation amount and how it would be proportioned per, you know, fully eligible applicant? So we still have um, data needs right now. And it was important for me that we took the first steps and began the work and didn't get paralyzed in perfectionism and all the answers. And um, so we are we are we are moving forward, acknowledging this is the first step independent. It's insufficient, yeah. but it's a first step. And so we still need um, data understanding um, how fully how many residents have lost, how how many might be interested in applying in the future? What is the um, projected sort of wealth loss? And the data needs go on and on. And so not only in Evanston, but all of the municipalities that I'm working with are um, under capacity and don't have the uh, skill set on staff to go into the deep data dive that we actually need to do this work. And so that's why partners like um, you, the work that Enith is doing, the Redress Network have been so crucial in supporting us in Evanston as well as supporting other municipalities because we have needed more data than we have access to. We have narrative and we have kind of high level and we have legislative history and so on, um, but the data has not always been as easy for us to get. And I think, oh no, I was just say that's one of the most fascinating parts about being the tip of the spear. You know, the first mover is you're grappling, and there's no you know pre-existing template by which to execute. So I, I think I applaud your work, and I think it's just so incredible that you know it's it's a process of uh, learning and growth, um, but that knowing that the, 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 there's evolution capacity for the way that data can can drive the the policy development process. And I just wanted to say that in setting up the reparations lab, it was very clear to me, coming from a, a banking background, financial background, that you need information, you need very, very precise um, data to direct your capital in the way that will be more impact, the most impactful. But even as importantly as the direction is the, the um, offflow effects, right? So I've invested, X number of dollars, I need to understand as well as I can 
in making that investment decision, what the impact is likely to be. And data is going to be central to that. Information about the community, about the capacity, about the need. And then because the lab is really interested in having, um, a, it says we have reparations in name for a very specific purpose. One is to identify in the minds of, of our audience that the harm and the presentation of the racial wealth gap and the social determinants of health inequalities did not just happen for a short period of time. They come from a place, right? From a, a particular historical perspective, but also reparation speaks to the fact that the repair will have to be long-term in, 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 in its um, application. And so for us, the data in terms of targeting and managing and measuring and being able to report year over year over year, are we actually having an impact on um, home ownership, on mortgages? Are we really having an impact on closing that wealth divide that data has told us yeah. is around $264,000 um, um, between the mean, between black and the mean, um, black and white families? Yeah. We need to be able to measure that and then we can set ourselves some targets to say, this is where we will feel that we have gotten to an inflection point where the momentum will move it. And so the partnership with um, you, David, is, is really, really quite important for the lab to be data driven in, in um, approaching our partners and also designing the tools that we intend to design to impact on this area. Yeah. And that's a great transition. You know, one of my big takeaways from this case study is that, you know, the municipal level is the most fertile ground for action today, right? And it's so exciting to see uh, incremental momentum there, but it really isn't the only space. Um, there's a range of counterparties that can engage in these types of activities and have also engaged in historical discrimination and harm. And I know the RFL and First Repair kind of play in this very kind of um, multidimensional space. So if you could just speak to some of these other entities beyond local governments uh, and, and others that, that can kind of continue to contribute to the movement. Yeah, well, you know, we have um, banks, the quite large banks that we think of, J.P. Morgan, um, Citibank, Wells Fargo, have actually come out and issued apologies, right, for their involvement in the slave trade. But RFL's mandate is we will now have a bigger conversation about how do you not just have the apology, which we remember is one aspect of reparations, but how do you move into the compensation and restitution part of it? Mm -hmm. And the important message as well is that for these financial sectors, there is actually data that shows that investing in making black people wealthy makes money. You know, so it's not a zero sum game. Uh, Citibank um, did a fantastic research piece of a few years ago that demonstrated that there is a cost to the economy of racism. It costs the American economy as much as three to five percent GDP because of racist decisions about how you deploy capital and how you include black people in business transactions. So. We, for the banking and the private sector, there is money to be made, right? And as a former banker, you know, you just, it's important that you make that case. But we also have um, educational institutions. Georgetown is really um, in the news and very topical because they have confessed, um, and they're Catholic, so they confess um, that they sold their enslaved people at one point when the school was about to go under. And they sold their um, enslaved um, humans to prop up the, 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 the school. And so they've made an open apology and they've also engaged in a kind of reparative activity where they've offered um, scholarships to the descendants of the enslaved. We have um, the Jesuit order of the Catholic Church has also issued an apology and I know, and they're looking at um, how they can direct the repair. We have um, within the, uh, the school space, we have Princeton University, which is an interesting one, that um, there was news about them removing the name of a slave owner from one of the buildings. And whilst they, there's not history that they actually had enslaved people working on campus, such many campuses do, the person who, be, who started and made it the request to, to establish Princeton was a slave owner, right? And so these 
kind of truth telling and reconciliation and conversations are happening in those spaces. Um, within the religious fraternity, we spoke about the Catholic Church, but we also have, I think, a Cross, and, and Robin, I think you encounter this quite a lot. Many, many conversations in all denominations have happened. And the Quakers are having a really large and deep conversation. The um, World Council of Churches is, is having a real deep conversation about acknowledging the role of the church in enabling and um, uh, giving, I want to say, giving cover for, to, to be very colloquial uh, to the enslavers, right? Um, and saying we were wrong. Well, how can we now enter into the repair conversation? And then, um, the, as I said, this is an international movement. So in the Caribbean, there's, the, there's a reparations commission that's been established by 10 islands that were owned by um, the colonial powers of Britain and France in particular. Haiti is, is a really egregious case of, um, of um, harm because Haiti actually fought the French and um, earned their freedom. And, they, and then the French turned around and said, not so fast, right? So here's a, a, a nation of enslaved people that fought their enslaved, became free in 1804, and Haiti said, not so fast, you now need to pay us back for the loss of our property, right? Of the entire island and the wealth of, of, of the island. And so these conversations are happening Again, as, as I said, there's a richness and an and a urgency to the conversation. And I think, Robin, you've been involved for much longer than I have been on, in the side of the conversation. I'm feeling that we may be at a place where we can get some big things done, some, some real movement happen, um, because of just the variety and the range of actors who are coming to the table and who are really seeking to engage in answers and and, and act, activity to move forward. I'm just gonna jump in and it is like perfectly covered the slide, but I just wanna give um, a little feedback on what's happening here and our city taking that first step. For me, the introduction was always a call to action for all of Evanston to um, do their part uh, for repair. And so what's happening now is our religious organizations, our Jewish denominations, our uh, Catholic churches, inter, interfaith community, Methodists, and all of our ally congregations are beginning to uh, raise funds, have their own independent reparations funds, and contribute those funds to the Reparation Stakeholder Authority, Evanston, a Black independent body of leaders for the Black community to direct those funds and how we might repair um, the community through uh, their allyship. Additionally, businesses have uh, begun to contribute a portion of their proceeds to the reparation fund, identify specific products where 100% of those proceeds go to the reparations fund. Um, local government, our action has inspired uh, our state made an introduction, a leader at, at the state of Illinois made an introduction for reparations. Um, there's still a lot more work to do. But it is also important to note the precedent, the history of important federal legislation being inspired by a local initiative, an instigator wow. at a hyper-local municipal level. Look at school wow. desegregation and marriage equality and ban the box and so on. And so we can see how the momentum from the passage of this first legislation in 2019 now has 195 co-sponsors in the House for uh, HR 40, where it hadn't had near as many in over 30 years being introduced in 1989, only just passing out of committee for the first time in over 30 years last year, passing out of judiciary. And so we all um, are working together and it takes all of these institutions to get to the full repair that we're hopeful for. Yeah, thank you, Robin. I love that insight about the power of network effects, right? So Local Action in Evanston had all these continued knock-on effects to a broader network of stakeholders. Um, I think this is a perfect time to pivot and spend the, the balance of our time looking at how open data plays into this and how it can really, you know, in our collective belief, serve as an accelerant for, you know, effective reparative action in the form of precision in the policy process. Um, you know, and as, as we touched on earlier in the session, we we looked at what harms um, can 
be directly and indirectly associated with very specific private sector action um, in this case, right? And how we think of open data from a from a kind of strategic perspective is looking at harms and then finding data points that can serve as proxies for those harms to begin directional measurement of those impacts, right? And of course, there's a lot of statistical best practices that that um, come into play in terms of isolating and um, measuring kind of disparate impact in, in, in a robust, accurate way. Um, and those are kind of methodological that we'll touch on shortly. But with, with the richness of open data communities, particularly like New York City, who's really kind of a, a front runner in the movement, um, you know, you're able to um, articulate what, what we call harm indicators, right? And map those to the harm description. And so very quickly, you're able to say, okay, what are some things that we can quantify quantifiably, you know, articulate that align with the harm that we know is related um, or emanated from, from the discriminant action, right? So here we see, you know, like, for example, the environmental space, these are evidence-based kind of harm indicators that are tightly, tightly aligned to um, an action, right? So pro proximity to um, hazardous materials, right? And New York City has uh, data sets on that, access to green spaces and park space, um, proximity to heat islands in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the area of healthcare and housing, also very tightly defined indicators that align with the, with the known harm, right? So what's really cool is when you look, when, when we have kind of bright, bright, transparent data sets like New York, we can very quickly um, extract data sets that help us to have, you know, heuristics or directional um, articulations of what these look like in these sub-jurisdictions where we're able to do kind of expose and control experiments, right? So red line versus non. And look at, you know, time scales where a policy is in effect, like Robin mentioned, um, you know, before before the, the, the abolishment of, of a specific city ordinance, for example. So what we have is this really rich and, you know, uh, detailed uh, a tool set by which to begin to articulate and measure uh, these impacts. And one thing that's super interesting about New York that, 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 that should be considered is the array of jurisdictional diversity in which these data sets come, right? So the Department of Finance, for example, has a data set called the Pluto data set, which provides, you know, nearly 100 metadata points on every um, property footprint in the city, which, you know, numbers, you know, approximately a million across the five boroughs, right? And those, from, from that level of granularity all the way to the five boroughs, data can be collected, aggregated, and reported at all these dimensions. So a really key question that we as kind of stakeholders, uh, policymakers, just community, community members need to ask is what's the level of expressiveness that matters most at which we can articulate, you know, the impact of this harm. So in some cases, you know, maybe the, the property level is too granular and we're, we're not able to really um, understand, uh, the, the data isn't able to provide a, a clear story around, um, you know, the disparate impact. Whereas in some cases, a community district or a borough is too, the, the data isn't expressive enough, right? Or the data resolution isn't clear enough. So. This is also a really critical consideration. And what New York has done that I think is really powerful is, you know, one of the beating hearts of open data is the, 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 the Census Bureau's American Community Survey, which is released every, day, every year or every 12 month uh, period. It has, you know, economic, demographic, educational and social determinants at, um, at census tract levels. But in New York, we generally uh, measure things at the NTA level, which is na neighborhood tabulation. Mm -hmm. And so they provide mapping tables between those two jurisdictions, right? So having that language around what is the jurisdictional um, commu communication mechanism that matters most to your stakeholders is, is really worthwhile to have. So I, I want to pass it to Robin and Enith to just talk about a, a call to action for practitioners in the field who are seeing, you know, the kind of action that's happening at the municipal level and with other types of stakeholders. How can data, we, we've, we have such a powerful start in this broader movement, but what can be done to even, you know, further power, um, you know, the role of data in helping um, increase both, again, the effectiveness and the accuracy of these analytical exercises and how they can affect the, the policymaking process. I think I think Robin 
pointed to the need that exists for the work that she's doing. Um, First of Care is actually a partner to many of the reparations efforts that are happening around the country and the municipalities. And um, Robin, you spoke about just the, the, the capacity issue um, that so many of these initiatives have that are very local, right? So very local, the skill set is, is, is not there. But um, as Evanston um, shows and demonstrates, if you follow the data, it gets very, very difficult to push back as hard as we know the pushback is, is, is there, right? Um, because one of the things, um, when Robin tells the story, one of the points that sticks out to me is as she crafted um, and, and, and moved the legislation through, was the need to um, put scaffolding around it, right? To, to, to kind of protect it from the um, the public and even internally focus on why are we doing this? What is it, you know, how how can you even identify who's been harmed? And we hear that in the larger reparations movement, how are you going to tell the difference between someone who is, uh, you know, 12th generation African-American born in America or, or someone like myself who's an immigrant, right? But who has children who are American. So I think the, um, the, 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 the need is there. And Robin, you want to just pick up a little bit more on just how important it is for this kind of um, uh, skill set to be a part of the reparations conversation. Sure. Um, so I led with data. I led with the limited data that I had access to as an alderman, and it was very, very limited, but it was enough to build the case. I didn't lead with a moral argument or my personal grievances or um, anything other than the data and what we said we valued as a municipal uh, community. And if our data is leading us uh, further away from um, our values, then we need to do something radically different. And so my argument was really data-driven. We, we, we depend on data for everything else in government. Every other area, environmental justice and infrastructure and programming and so on, and so I thought, let's lead with the data in reparations. And so I had, again, about five data points that I led with to build the case for reparations and um, a lot of faith and believe that our city had the heart and the will to make it happen. Um, but I would say the need right now is for those in this profession to um, really step up and help with deep dive um, data and research to support these uh, various efforts. And in, in our case, it was all data driven. I felt the moral argument should have already been uh, won with the conditions and the still racially segregated community. We are applauding ourselves for our diversity and inclusion. I'm sure it's the same in New York and how great we are and diverse and rich, uh, but still driving home to segregated communities. And I knew that that was not the city that we wanted to be and led with the data. Yeah. So I want, you know, in the interest of time, I want to thank our panelists for their incredible insight. I think this was such a powerful dialogue and just, you know, shows us how much work has been done and how much work is left to do. Um, we want to leave you with a set of resources from both an advocacy and data perspective. And this session will be recorded and available to all. Just wanted to thank you all again for participating and um, we have a wonderful afternoon and evening.